few things, well, one, one main thing before I start, go back and talk about falling balls. Um, there are still a few of you who are having trouble getting connected with the, the Wiley Plus textbook and homework site. So just brief announcement on this. Go to this website. This is the one I maintain on my, on my own server um, so that it's world readable and all that stuff. If you don't know how to find this, get, grab a syllabus. That are, they're still down here on this table here. And it's got the, the uh, web address, the URL. Uh, alternatively, go to Colab for this class. And it has right up there on the front page uh, a link to, the, to my page, OK? So go there and follow these nifty instructions right here. You, you, you'll need to go to Colab to get access to the book. You go there and you click on the UVA digital access and walk through that. So that'll get you a 10-digit code eventually that you'll need. And the next thing to do is follow the instructions on this flyer right there. That flyer knows the, num the URLs to go to and the, the number for this course and where you put in your 10-digit personal code. And once you do that, you'll be able to get into the book. And in chapter one, the section of the home page there uh, for this class, the chapter one at the bottom is problem set one. All right? Uh, Two cents about the problem set. It's 26 independent conceptual problems about the stuff we've been talking about. And you can go, come and go as you like. Uh, so you don't have to complete the problem set. It's not a quiz. You don't have to sit there and do it in one sitting. Go and look at the problems and think about them. And when you're finally really comfortable with your answer, then submit, OK? Be careful not to, not to click on the Submit to Gradebook buttons before you've done any work um, that has happened before. If you do that, let me know, and we'll reset your problem set. Um, and the homeworks are they're not pledged work or anything. Talk about them among yourselves or with me. That's why I hold, problem, uh, problem. That's why I hold office hours. So Monday afternoon, for example, I'll be in Alderman Cafe after class until 5 o'clock or so. Um, not immediately after class, but close. And come and talk to me at the problem set questions if you don't understand stuff. So by the time you actually submit the questions, you should be confident in your answers. Not, it's not like the point is to learn the material. And you learn the material by suffering over it, alas. Physics is about thinking. And if you don't think through the questions, you just, just try them. Yeah, you know, you'll get some random grade, but, but, uh, but mostly you won't have learned the material well. It's, it takes active involvement to, get to, really, to really get this stuff. Any, any other thoughts or issues? OK. Yeah, please. Ah, repeat the days when I'm available to go over problem sets. My office hours are essentially all of, of Monday afternoon, as soon as I can get over there, which is usually like half past the hour, give or take, until 5 o'clock in Alderman Cafe. So I'm coming out to you guys, essentially, assuming that Alderman is not torn apart yet. Is that anybody know whether is Alderman torn? It's still OK? The cafe is still there? All right. I don't get out much. Uh, and then, then Wednesday morning, 9 to 11, I'm in my office downstairs. So it's, it's not on this long corridor, the, the old building. It's on the, uh, the quarter heading off to the annex, 133. So I'll be in there. So ask me questions. And, and before and after class, I'm pretty much available, too. OK? So that's all good. All right, let me get this out of here. We left off last time with, with and, and, and thank you for breaking the ice. You, you're, you're welcome to ask me questions live. It still works. Hands still work and all that, all right? Uh, you can still ask me on, the, on the, uh, the gadgets. That works, too. And actually, I've got various ones coming in toward the end of the hour that I want to sort of deal with. And here at the beginning of the semester, I'm trying, in effect, to set aside the nuisance issues, the complexity of our real world, uh, to, to look at the simplicity of things kind of without worrying about all the details. And so with skating, if you recall, I. I I said, we're going to forget it. We're not going to worry about friction. We're not going to worry about air resistance. Uh, we get gravity out of the picture early on by working on a horizontal surface. And then you can just see inertia, 
life gets simple, okay? So that was the first, first topic was the skater moving around, spending a lot of time moving as inertia had in mind. Then with falling balls, I introduced the first force, the first influence that can change things so, they, so they're not inertial. That force is the force due to gravity, also known as the object's weight. So a ball isn't a free object here on the surface of the Earth. It isn't a free object that can, that can show you inertia in its pure and simple form. Yeah, it's got a weight. And because it's got a weight, it, it doesn't just, if you, an object, at, a ball at rest doesn't stay at rest because gravity's in there, all right? And so what gravity's influence is that it causes it to fall. And I, um, what falling is, is moving under the influence of one and only one force, gravity, or equivalently, the weight of the object, the ball. You okay so far? You may not know where I'm going. Where I'm going is I want to talk about, I got, got involved talking about terminal velocity, if you recall, and I want to make sure that I leave that clear in everybody's mind. If we neglect air resistance, basically anything having to do with the air, it's the motion of a falling ball is a falling ball. It, it, it's a falling ball, and it's very simple. It accelerates downward. And in a minute, I'll go back to how it accelerates downward, um, the details a little bit. However, if we look ahead, and we're actually going to look ahead in, in this, we're looking ahead to the end of October when air resistance starts showing up, for real. Like, we actually look and see what the heck is going on with air resistance. You all know about air resistance. You live with it. Uh, if you include air resistance in the falling process, life gets more complicated. This is why, basically, I set it aside for right now, but because it came up in, in a bunch of questions, I'll, I'll give you a preview, or, or you know, do, it, do it adequately. And that is that a falling, uh, when you drop a ball from rest here on, near the surface of Earth, and you don't drop it very far, it never gets moving very fast. It you know, moves fast enough, but it, you don't really notice the effects of air resistance. But as someone asked me, if you drop it out of an airplane, then you notice the effects of air resistance. And what, what happens is the ball isn't a, a falling ball anymore in the pure sense. It's got two forces acting on it. It's still got its weight down, but now it's got an air resistance force up, fighting the movement through the air. And when that gets strong enough, it eventually equals the ball's weight. And the ball now is experiencing two forces that cancel, and it doesn't accelerate anymore. It comes down steadily. Is that okay? And the terminal speed of a baseball, yeah, I should know this, it's come up, I think it's 100 miles an hour. So if you drop it out of an airplane, you, drop it from, you can drop it from 30,000 feet. It will not come down at tremendous speed. It'll come down 100 miles an hour, approximately, because it gets the air resistance just affects it too much. And if you drop two different balls, then they get different air resistance. The effects of air resistance are different. So someone asked me about density, uh, one of these questions. Does that matter too? Well, the effects of terminal velocity, the, the cause of terminal velocity, air resistance namely, uh, affects things according to their surface, not what's inside them. So if you drop two balls about the same size, so they have the same surface, they'll get about the same air resistance at, at a, any particular speed. But because this one doesn't weigh very much, this is a foam ball, they'll, it will surely lag behind the baseball, probably even from this height. Let's try it. It barely, it's barely behind. So although this, this thing is, whoo, you know, it's light and fluffy, it's, and it is experiencing air resistance that is gumming up its acceleration compared to the ball. Now, it's not very much, and so you don't notice it. All right? So for, for dropping stuff out of a building uh, or, or off, you know, from a building on the ground, toward the ground, you, you're not going to notice air resistance much unless it's really, really light and fluffy like a sheet of paper. Okay? Any questions about terminal velocity, that idea? In fact, it's a preview. It's something in our future, more, although I'm, I've done a decent justice to it right now. Uh, I'll point out one other thing is that really little things that have a lot of surface compared to their weight fall, can reach terminal velocity very slowly. For example, dust. What keeps dust up? Dust is, is, is heavy stuff. I mean, it, it's ordinary stuff, like, like chalk dust, powdered chalk. Go 
pound on the erasers there, you'll see it falling. It's chalk. It's, it's dense stuff, but it comes out really slowly because air resistance is tremendous for it. It barely you know, it struggles to get through the, the, uh, the air. Any other questions about, about uh, falling balls in the presence of air? Okay, so I'll leave that. Leave that. Uh, does density affect? Yeah, we got that. All right. Um, so actual falling. Go, go back to that. The, the observation, one of the key observations I made last time is that pick whatever balls you like. That if they differ in mass, they also differ in weight. Because amazingly enough, er, the Earth's gravity exerts a force on every ball that is exactly proportional to its mass. So mass is an inertial thing, how hard it is to accelerate. Why gravity cares about that, who knows? I mean, well, people do know, but the details are de complicated. But it, it is that way, and therefore, the heavier ball, which by itself would make it fall faster, accelerate faster, is also more massive, which by itself would make it accelerate slower, and they cancel. So everything accelerates downward at the same rate, which semi-inconveniently is about 9.8 meters per second squared. If it were exactly 10, 10 meters per second squared, it'd be like simpler, but oh well, it's a little less than that. It is a measured value. It's not, there's nothing fundamental about it. It has to do with the, sh the size of the Earth and the mass of the Earth. If you go to the moon, things fall on the moon, too. Um, if you, assuming you're not a conspiracy theorist who thought the moon landings never occurred, the astronauts on the moon uh, were, were playing around with, you know, oh, wow, you know, we can jump and stuff like that, and you fall slowly there. Why? Because the, acceler the acceleration due to gravity is smaller there by about a factor of six. It means that if you take a kilogram, here on the Earth, a kilogram develops about 9.8 newtons of weight. Remember a newton? It's the, the unit of force. 9.8 newtons for every kilogram here on Earth. On the moon, it's about 1.6 newtons for every kilogram. Gravity's weaker. Things weigh less. Uh, mass is the same, because mass is an inertial quantity. So a kilogram is still a kilogram on the moon, but the weight's down. And so when you drop it, it, it accelerates more slowly by about a factor of six. And then one of the astronauts played golf. And golf is complex because air is definitely involved in golf here on Earth. On the moon, no air. But still, the, he can hit the ball a long way. No one went to retrieve the golf balls. All right? So. What else? One thing then I'll do with this to just get you thinking about it. There, this question. I want to ask you this question with, with your clickers, okay? Is it up there? It is. Woohoo! All right. And I, and I talked a little about this. I'm hearing myself whistle. When you drop something, it accelerates, which means that it goes faster and faster and faster as it, with every second of falling. And so what happens if you drop something, like your cell phone, it falls off a balcony, ah, and two seconds from now, it is going to hit the ground. And you are super speedy, you know, one of the, the little, little kid in Incredibles. Uh, you, you zip down and grab it after it's fallen for one second. So half the fall in time. You okay with that? After, it's two seconds, it will hit the ground. In one second, where is it to grab it? How far above the ground is it? Or in this case, the way I've asked it is, how, what, what fraction of the distance has it fallen to the, toward the ground? How much progress has it made? You okay with the question? Questions on the question? Let me bring this sucker over here and start it. Oh. There it goes. And you could talk about this among yourselves too. I'll, I'll give you to, to 45 seconds after the. This incidentally is the same kind of question I've asked almost every year on, on one of the exams. So <laughs> think about it.
four, three, two, one, zero. The vast majority are, are going for A, which is the right, di the right answer. Yay! You guys are good. Let me, let me for those of you who, who, who didn't get it, let me tell you why. And that is, when you drop the ball, it starts motionless, zero velocity. After the first second of travel, it begins to accelerate steadily. And after one second of travel, it will have developed a velocity of 9.8 meters per second. That's what the nine, that's what, what it happens if you accelerate at 9.8 meters per second, per second, for a whole second, you, you, you get up to 9.8 meters per second. Of course, in the downward direction, there's a direction to the whole thing. So the, so the average velocity during that first second is actually the, the, the average of those starting and finishing values. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a simple situation where you go steadily from, from motionless to 9.8. So the average velocity is halfway in between. It's, it's just under five. So let's just say five. Your average velocity is five meters per second. So that's, all, that's what the cell phone traveled, five meters in one second. You, you okay so far? The average speed was halfway in between, that being 5.5 5 meters per second. You, you traveled that for one second. Overall, that's five meters. How about the second second then? The second second, you start, the cell phone started at already moving down at about 10 meters per second. Uh, it, bear with me if I just, just rounded 10 instead of 9.8. It's just simple. So, so it starts that second at 10 meters per second downward, and it finishes at 20 meters per second downward, having accelerated steadily. So its average speed during the second second was the average of those two, actually, which is about 15 meters per second. It's much faster on average during that second second. How much faster? By a factor of three. So during the second second, it traveled about 15 meters. So in the first second, it went five meters. The second meter went three times as far, 15 meters. That's where you, if you want to catch it after one second, go, to the, go, go five meters down, a quarter of the way to the, to the ground. Is that OK? And I, I did a, my harangue about this, that, that, that falling, last time I was going to remind you that, that falling, again, neglecting air resistance, you travel much faster at the end, toward the end of the fall than at the beginning, and therefore falls of any duration in time become distance problems, huge distance problems if you want to travel, if you want to fall past a few seconds. I mean, I don't know whether you want to fall at all, but um, for bungee jumping or for drop towers, for any of these, these experiments, in fact, where you want things to just be in free fall. It's very hard to make them fall for 10 seconds. That's too long. You get going downwards so fast, it's just it's horrendous. You, know, you travel way too far. All right? All right, so let me get out of this, go come back to the real world. So what about falling up? Well. If I toss a ball upwards, so, so just, just try to finish up falling balls here. Ball drop from rest has this behavior. We've talked about it. it accelerates downward, and it covers more and more distance every second. What if you toss it up? But it's actually the same story. When you toss it up, the moment it leaves my hand in this case, it's no longer experiencing a force for me. I'm, I'm not touching it. The only force that's, that's acting on it, neglecting air, is gravity. It's weight. So it's accelerating downward at 9.8 meters per second again, second squared again. What is, how does that affect it? That slows it down at first. It's moving upward, but accelerating downward, that's OK. I can do that myself. You know, here's my human animation version of it. I am going to have a velocity to the right, but an acceleration to the left. Story hasn't started yet. Let me get started. Okay. Now I'm going, OK? I'm going to accelerate velocities this way. I'm going to accelerate that way. I slow down. I come for an instant, for a moment, to stop. And then I'm accelerating. I'm faster and faster. And, you know, all the way. I can still talk to you out here, of course. Once in a while, I forget a demo and I go off into the collection. Anyway, we'll get there eventually. So it is perfectly possible to accelerate opposite your velocity. When that happens, you, you slow down. That, 
So when you hit the brakes in a car, you are accelerating backward even though you're still moving forward. With the ball, we're okay so far? With the ball, it's moving upward but accelerating downward. So it too slows, comes momentarily to a stop, and then it's as though it was dropped from up there. The motion continues as though it was dropped from up there. You okay with that? So I can ask you this question. So you jump upward from a springboard and will not worry about you hitting the springboard on the way back. You jump straight up, okay? And then you land in the pool of entry. At the peak of your jump, so when you're at the highest altitude you ever achieve, how about, what are your velocity and your acceleration like? You okay with the question? Any questions about the question? Here we go. Go for it. And again, talk to each other if you... The correct, the correct answer is, is in the majority, but there are a lot of you that do, that do not have the correct answer. I'll give you to the minute, to the 60 second point. Three, two, one, zero. Pretty spread out. A, however, is the answer. So let me, let me, for those of you who didn't get A, what's the issue here? At the top of your jump, once, once you're off the board, again, neglecting air, um, you're a falling object. The only force acting on you is your weight. Therefore, what's your acceleration? Tell me, or think about it. What's your acceleration? Is it zero? It's, it's, ne it's negative, or downward. Uh, incidentally, that brings up the idea of negative acceleration. Sometimes when you're working strictly vertically, in the vertical direction, we take a shorthand. Instead of saying that's up and that's down, we just go like positive and negative. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, an abbreviation in effect. So negative acceleration in this case is, it can, is, a, is a shorthand for just saying downward acceleration. Okay? So when you're, off, when, you're, when you're a free falling object, I don't care where you are in that jump, top, bottom, middle, you're accelerating downward. So your acceleration is not zero. So that means um, C and D are, are off the table because your acceleration is steady. It's just your weight divided by your mass. That's your acceleration. We know what that is. 9.8 meters per second every time. All right? How about the... So we're, we're, we're comparing choice A and B because C and D are, are out. Any questions why C and D are out? Your, your acceleration is constant. If your velocity were constant, in any context, you are not accelerating. That's what it, acceleration is a change in your velocity. So your velocity cannot be constant, even at the top of the jump. It sure seems like it would be constant at the top of the jump, because it doesn't seem to be moving. There is a, it's true that there's a moment when the, when the, when the ball is not, it, is not moving. It's, mo, it's motionless. Its velocity at that instant is zero. But that doesn't mean it was it's zero in the next instant, or the next instant, or the next instant. It's only zero for an instant. It's changing the whole time. If you, if you watch the movie mentally and back up a little bit, where, there you are, almost to the top of your jump, your velocity's upward. If it weren't upward, you wouldn't be heading toward the top. You'd already be at it. So roll back in time a little bit on the film, you're heading upward, velocity's up, and not zero. And if you go a little forward in time, past the peak, you're heading downward. And your velocity is not zero either. So you've swooped through zero. You've gone from heading up through zero to heading down 
and there's a, you're, there's a moment when you pass by it. You pass by zero. And it, I can draw this as a graph for those of you who, who, who have a, sort of want to see it visually. Let's call this. So those of you who don't want to, to think even vaguely mathematically, sorry. So your velocity, this is upward. That's downward. Your velocity starts upward when you leave the board. And you accelerate steadily downward. So your velocity is becoming less and less upward, less and less upward. Bing, it goes through zero. And then it keeps on going, and now it's downward. That's the moment of peak height, when your velocity is no longer upward. And you've reached the highest you're ever going to go. And you haven't yet started a downward to, to descend from the highest. OK? Uh, at the peak height, your velocity truly is zero. That is correct. So someone wrote in about that. There is that moment of motionlessness. But it doesn't stay. You swoop right through it. All right? <sighs> Last thing to, to, to talk about, let me get this out of here, in the context of falling balls. We've done the up and down. A lot of falling going there. How about if you toss the ball at an angle? And apropos of tonight, every, you know, OK, so now you're going to have this nasty thing come up in your mind every time you see a pass play. You know, oh no, physics came and bit me. All right? What's the ball doing in this context? That's, that's my best spiral. Um, <laughs> woo! All right. It's doing two things at once. You know, anyway, vertically, the only force on it is a vertical force. It's weight. So vertically, it is falling. It is accelerating downward 9.8 meters per second squared. That's life. Horizontally, there is no force on it. It's coasting. So it is simultaneously. And it, it, the, the details come out. You know, in fact, can come out in the mathematics and stuff. But it, don't worry about it. The issue is vertically, it's rising to peak height, slower and slower and slower then descending faster and faster and faster, just like everything else I've been doing up and down. Horizontally, it's just inertial. Apart from, from the little air issue, it's just steadily making progress. OK? And that combination of a, of a rise, slow, 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 faster, 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 together with steady, steady, steady down, downfield motion gives you these arcs. They happen to be parabolas, but uh, it's OK. You OK with it so far? Let me show you a video. A number of years ago, I made an online version of at least the, the start of this class. And as part of that, I went over to the AFC, and I filmed three guys who were shooting. It was a coincidence. They were out there shooting from half court and sinking the basketball nearly every shot. I couldn't believe it. Some people, I could stand over the, the, the rim and miss. All right? So, so here are these guys. Let me do this right. All right? So this guy on the left is going to shoot the basket. He's standing on the half court line. And play. Here is a beautiful three point shot right through the basket. And here is that same shot again with all the previous basketball images lingering on the screen. And here is a still photograph of that same shot showing you all the basketball images. And I've marked it up so that you can see the ball's vertical component of motion and its downfield component of motion. The ball's vertical motion is that of a falling object. The ball rises quickly at first, then more and more slowly. It's momentarily neither rising nor descending, and then it descends more and more quickly as it approaches the basket. The ball's horizontal motion, the motion along the downfield coordinate direction, is that of a coasting object. The ball is moving steadily downfield uh, at a uniform pace. And it looks like the, the, the vertical yellow lines are getting closer and closer together only because the ball is getting farther and farther from us. And because of our perspective on this shot then, 
the lines that are far away from us appear closer together. Those Let me stop that then. So, so you, I hope you can appreciate the, the, this, this image that really, if, if you dissect a, one of these long arcs, it re, the, really, the ball really is rising to peak height and descending, and it, you know, it's slowing down as it's going up, and then speeding up as it goes down. It's just, just a steady downward acceleration throughout. And horizontally, it's just coasting. And so I, I got a question come, that just came in here, that if you throw a ball horizontally, is it, is it going to have a constant velocity? It will have a constant horizontal portion of its velocity, what's known as a component. The horizontal component of its velocity will be constant. And actually, that's true whether you throw it horizontally or at some cockeyed angle. It doesn't matter. Whatever the original horizontal component of velocity was, it'll keep that because there's no force to, to speed it up or slow it down acting horizontally. It just coasts. The vertical part uh, depends entirely on, on what you gave it as the initial vertical component of velocity. If you gave it no vertical component of velocity, it will just arc downward. Uh, if you gave it some upward vertical component of velocity, it will have a, a, a more upward turned arc. Is that okay? So, so the, the basketball has a constant velocity because there, there was a force throwing it and the diver and the clicker question doesn't. In both of these contexts, once the diver leaves the board or the ball leaves the, per, the thrower's hand, the only force acting on, on the two, the diver and the, and the basketball, is gravity. So it's pure downward acceleration at the usual value. The actual motion of these two objects depends on what they were doing. Because remember, velocity is, a, is to an extent an inherited thing. Your velocity at any given instant has to do with what, what it was a moment ago, plus any acceleration that occurred between. So the diver started, in my story, stri heading straight up, and therefore rose to peak height and came back down straight. The basketball traveled in an arc because the, the guy throwing it didn't throw it straight up, threw it at an angle. And it, it made progress horizontally by, uh, because it had that initial horizontal component of velocity. OK? All right. Uh. So that's my story of falling balls. Any other questions about falling balls? Things? All right. Ramps, story of ramps. So another topic. And start out here with, I'll just take a bowling ball, set it precariously on the table. It's hard even to keep it from rolling around. I do not want to have it hit the floor. It's always too, you know, it's, it's fun, but too startling. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll begin with this question. Suppose, uh, Gotta write the, there's the right question. All right. It's too hard. There we go. It's up there. Wow, all right. Got, uh, can, can a ball ever push downward on a horizontal table with a force that is greater than the ball's weight? You okay with the question or questions? Questions about the question. Any? This is a horizontal table. It's, it's, one, it's, it's flat. Can that, can that ball push down on the table hard, harder? And, and instantly, this is, I'm not allowed to touch it. You're not allowed to touch it. So it's the ball on the table. That's the only objects in the story. Is that OK? Yeah, August? Can the ball fall? Ooh, prescient question. I didn't forbid it. If it's not forbidden, it's allowed, OK? So the ball can fall. See what you think about this. And uh, discuss it among yourselves and pay attention to August's question.
that, it's, that's allowed too. You're, you're allowed to throw it down. I'm, you're just not allowed to touch it when it hits. <laughs> All right, finish up here in the next 10 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, zero, and click, and whoop, there's still, there are, you know, it's, it's, it's two to one in favor of yes, which incidentally is far more towards yes than, than the historical average across many semesters. So you guys are, are thinking, can someone suggest a way I can make the ball push down on the table harder than its weight? Throw it. Okay. So there. In fact, I can I can augment the table a little bit here, right? Oh, this isn't this is too fun, right? I gotta aim better. Okay? So that that the can doesn't doesn't mind the weight of you know 16 pound bowling ball. <laughs> I didn't kill anything. Wow, that's good. I mean, the can's seen better days. There's the can. <laughs> we only dropped the golf ball. Not, a, not such a disaster. Do you think the ball pushed downward on the table can greater than its weight? Yeah. It exerted a tremendous downward force on the can. Uh, sometimes called an impact force. When the, so here's the story. So I just, we, we're heading towards how, how ramps work, but here, here's the underlying issues. This ball right now is experiencing two forces. It's weight downward and a push up from the table. And they're both on the ball and they cancel perfectly. How do I know that? Because the ball is not accelerating. It's motionless and staying that way. So the net force on it is zero. And that means that, I have to add a detail. So the, the table's pushing up on the ball with a force equal to the ball's weight. It perfectly, but in that direction, they perfectly cancel the ball. Uh, the question I asked you was not about the force the table exerts on the ball. It was actually about the force the ball exerts on the table. That's a subtle difference. You okay with the difference? The crazy, amazing thing is those two forces, the force the table exerts on the ball and the force the ball exerts on the table, come as a pair. Um, they are, I call them a Newton's third law pair. And they are related to Newton's third law. What's Newton's third law? It's the observation that if an, one object pushes on the other, the, B, put object A pushes on object B, object B pushes back on object A equally hard in the opposite direction every time, without exception. So, example that. I, if you push on the person sitting next to you properly, will, you know, are there, is there ever a case when they do not push back? Even if they're asleep, even if they're surfing the web, okay, no, they will always push back. They can't help it. You have a statue next to you. You push on it, it pushes back. And are the forces ever not equal in strength, opposite direction, but strength? Never, okay. So um, it's an observation of our world. It, it actually is it's built into the. The, the, the mathematical details of our world in such a way that, that if, it, if it weren't true, we'd have a mess. It would be a, a chaotic world, but a chaotic universe. So they go, they go together. Well, this is now, this seems like a terrible distraction from, from the issue at hand, which is I dropped the ball on the table and, and smashed the can. What's hap what happened during that is the, the can and the ball did push on each other. Can and the ball are pushing on each other now, equally hard in opposite directions. So the ball is pushing on the can, the can is pushing on the ball, 
those forces are equal in amount in opposite direction. How is it that the ball managed to, 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 to push harder than its weight? Well, at this moment, the ball is not accelerating. A fancy name, and a useful name for, for the ball's situation is it, it's at equilibrium. Uh, mechanical equilibrium means no acceleration, no, um, no net force. So it's got zero net force, it's at equilibrium. Is that okay? You can imagine, you, you go and s sit on a trampoline and you bounce around for a while and then you just sit there and settle. You'll be at equilibrium, zero net force. So it's at zero net force. And uh, that means that the, the can is pushing up on the ball with a force equal to the ball's weight to keep it from moving, uh, keep it from accelerating, and that the, the ball pushes back equally hard in opposite direction. It's pushing down on the can with a force equal to its weight. But if we're not at equilibrium, the ball is not at equilibrium. If it's accelerating, all bets are off. It's only th that, that all that arrangement, it's pushing just as hard as its weight, that only occurs because there's no acceleration here. If we allow acceleration, which we did, we dropped the ball and let it hit the can, and during that impact, it accelerated like crazy from heading down to basically not heading down at all. It lost this huge amount of downward velocity. During that time, it needed to be pushed up harder than its weight by the can. The can had to, had to make it accelerate upward. You know, no, 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 don't come here. And when, if, if the can pushed up harder than the ball's weight on the, on the ball, the ball pushed down on the can harder than its weight. So during that impact, huge force in, you know, in both directions. Two, two huge forces showed up as a pair. If you drop from a few inches, will, uh, will it have a, a, a severe effect versus dropping it higher? The higher you drop it from, the more time it has had to accelerate downward, and therefore the faster it was heading downward at, at the moment of impact. So just before the ball hits, let me get the can out of the way, it's fun, but it's just a just complicating the story. At, as, if you drop the ball from, from this height, it doesn't have very much time to, to acquire downward velocity. Therefore, the table can decelerate it to a stop. The word deceleration is just a, is a, is a shorthand for Accelerate opposite its velocity. Slow it down. Just, so, so deceleration is nothing new. So to, to accelerate the ball upward to stop it was easy for the table. But if I drop it from the, from the catwalk, it's going to have more trouble decelerating. It's got, first of all, it's going to be moving faster. I'm not going to drop the bowling ball. The bananas are past their prime. It's time, OK? What's the point of having a cool ancient building if you can't ex use it? Right. Hello. Fancy meeting you here. All right. So from this height, the ball, the, the, the uh, remember, in one second, things fall about five meters. I've got, a whole, I've got more than a second, give or take, pretty close to a second. A fall. When I drop this, it's going to have a whole second to acquire downward velocity. So it's going to be moving very fast. And the table is going to have to stop it, especially quickly because it's moving so fast. It's going to, if, I, if, it, if it allows even a hundredth of a second, that's a lot of distance traveled. It's going to break the, you know, punch a hole in the table. So this is going to be very bad for the banana. Big upward force. Ready? Get set. Ah! All right. Yeah, probably instead of the banana police coming after me, it's going to be the people with the butterfly nets and the white wrapper coat. All right. So I'm back. All right. So how high you drop it from matters. And I mean, you know this from, from falling yourself. You're falling a short distance. It's not the fall that hurts. It's the, it's the, it's the stopping at the bottom, right? Uh, Sad but true, you, you, you're, you're right there during the fall. Ah! All right. But at the impact, um, the faster you're moving, the longer you've had to fall, uh, the faster you're moving, the, the, the more it's a trouble. All right? 
other questions? Okay, so you know, where, where does this leave us? That when you, when you set an object like the ball on a table, the, the, the table, and, and it's the, the, the ball isn't accelerating, uh, you know the table's pushing up just hard enough to cancel the ball's weight. And that's the situation for a wagon, and we'll put the, the blocky kid in the, in the wagon. So there's the kid in it. And it's in that exact same situation. It's not accelerating, in fact, in any direction, so the net force on it we know is just zero. Uh, we do know it's got a weight. We, that was the whole story of falling balls. It now has a second force acting on it, evidently in the upward direction, perfectly canceling its weight. But what is that upward force? That upward force is exerted not by like, the whole earth like gravity, but rather by the sidewalk. So this is right now this piece of wood is playing sidewalk. And it's pushing up on the wagon just the right amount. What kind of force is that? I call it a support force. It has various other names that you've encountered it before, with it before, contact force and normal force. But it turns out that whenever any two surfaces touch each other, they push apart um, with, with these support forces. Uh, the, the purpose of the force is to keep the materials from, from occupying the same space at the same time. If this force didn't exist, that wagon would fall into the sidewalk. And nature, nature doesn't like that. The, the, the details of those, where the forces come from are, are interesting, but beyond the scope of what we're doing. So the sidewalk is exerting an a su upward support force on the wagon, perfectly canceling the wagon's weight. It's not accelerating. Everything's great. Your case so far? Let me point out that support forces always act exactly away from surfaces. I mean, perpendicular to surfaces, if the, if the word perpendicular means to you, or orthogonal. So for a horizontal surface like a sidewalk or this table, the support forces are always at right angles in every respect. They're up. This table cannot exert a, a support force at some wacky direction. It's straight up. OK? So uh, the wheels, incidentally, they're curved, so it might look complicated. But, but the bottom of the wheel, that part that's touching the sidewalk, is exactly horizontal, too, and it's pushing straight down on the sidewalk. Again, those, those two support forces, like all other forces, show up in pairs. The force of the sidewalk on the wheel, the force of the wheel on the sidewalk, they can't, you yeah. All right, um, let me give you an idea where we're gonna head. The sidewalk right now is horizontal, but with a little, a little bit of work, I can tip it and make a ramp out of it. And when the ramp happens, now the support force from the sidewalk now tilted, the ramp, it's not, straight up anymore. And it can't cancel the weight of the wagon properly. There's a leftover. So the, the support force is cockeyed now. And the wagon's weight is still straight down. The leftover causes ex acceleration. So, so we'll, we'll look at a wagon on a ramp and look at the forces on that. Anyway, have a good weekend. See you on Monday.